Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Nice to see you. I'm Glenn Wilson, and uh, the topic today is the sixth installment uh, of the series that I've been giving on the psychology, uh, and the, the evolutionary psychology, in fact, of mating and dating. And uh, this is the final installment called Love Sickness. It uh, deals with the more problematic and pathological side of love. Uh, there's an ag agony and an ecstasy. This is more about the agony than the ecstasy. Uh, this painting is by a 17th century Dutch painter called Jan uh, Steen, and uh, it's called Love Sickness. And it points up the fact that uh, love sickness has been recognized by the, uh, the early physicians going back into the years BC. And uh, in fact, it might be the origins of psychosomatic medicine that some of these physicians would diagnose love sickness in their patients by noting that they would uh, produce autonomic symptoms like sweating and racing pulse in the presence of a love object or even the mention of their name uh, when they would not uh, be so excited by the presence of other people and that enabled them to diagnose the, the likelihood that their physical symptoms, uh, their condition of distress was caused by unrequited love. Now, uh, our friend, um, well actually let's first of all use this device to move on. Uh, Woody Allen uh, is always good for a, a quotation and he said at one point that uh, in one of his films I felt all nauseous and tingly uh, all over um, either I was in love or I had chicken pox and it um, highlights the fact that there is a remarkable um, overlap in the symptoms of being in love and uh, various conditions of mental disorder the symptoms look very similar. You get mania, which is abnormally elevated mood. You feel exhilarated. Uh, your self-esteem is likely to be inflated. Uh, you may indulge in extravagant gift giving. These are things that are in common between the condition of mania and the condition of being in love. But then there are the, depre the depressive symptoms. Tearfulness, insomnia, loss of appetite and concentration occurs in, in people who are in love as well as people who are diagnosed as depressed. Obsessive compulsive symptoms also appear. Intense preoccupation with the loved one, checking things like checking to see whether they've sent you a text message or an email, uh, hygiene rituals, washing yourself over and over uh, to excess, the hoarding of valueless but uh, resonant items of one kind or another, all OCD symptoms. And indeed, Italian researchers, Marizzitti and colleagues, have established that uh, the condition of serotonin in the brain seems to be rather similar between people describing themselves as in love and those who are diagnosed as uh, having obsessional compulsive disorder. So again, considerable overlap. And uh, a colleague of mine called Frank Tallis has hypothesized uh, why do we go so crazy when we're in love? And his theory is that it, it is uh, a trick devised by nature to override any restraints that we might have from engaging in reproductive activity. It will make us do things that we uh, might otherwise have used our uh, very clever advanced human brains to restrain ourselves from doing. In fact, Somerset Maugham said something along the li lines of love is a dirty trick uh, played by nature to in ensure the um, replication of the, of the species. And uh, there could well be some truth in that idea. Now, if being in love is a painful condition, how much more so is uh, the loss of love or unreciprocated love? Uh, 
It happened that uh, quite recently this journalist called Mandy Appleyard gave a very detailed account of her own experience of being stood up by a lover that she had high hopes for and I picked out this little bit of her uh, narrative, her account. My misery following the split took me by surprise. It was intense. In tears and blinded by anxious headaches, I imagined him laughing at my gullibility. My emotional pain became physical, twisting knots in my neck and shoulder muscles that left me in agony. I felt flat, foolish, and tormented by the thought he had deceived me. He was apparently a married man, and he'd told her that he was separated, but uh, it turned out that he wasn't uh, <laughs> quite so finally separated after all. I bored my friends rigid with my forensic analysis of our relationship and its demise. I even rang a private detective with a view to recruiting his services. She was going to have him followed to see uh, where he went and how happy he was with his uh, wife and children. Uh, all of which, in retrospect, uh, she recognized was a little bit extreme. But uh, the pain uh, is very real. And indeed, uh, romantic breakup activates um, brain areas which are similar to those of the experience of pain. Uh, some researchers using fMRI, magnetic resonance imagery, uh, have found that when you get a person thinking about uh, a, a lover who's recently dumped them, then uh, the reaction of the brain is rather similar to that that uh, you observe if you press a hot probe against their, their arm, which is painful to, uh, to a normal person. And indeed, the uh, degree of pain registered in the brain is equivalent uh, between the, uh, the control person being hit with a hot probe <laughs> and uh, the person who has been dumped by a lover. The areas of the brain that are activated in unreciprocated love seem to overlap with the same areas of the brain that are um, active when a person describes themselves as being isn't in love. These are the mesolimbic reward centers of the brain uh, right in, in here, you have the, um, the ventral tegmental area, which is a key part of the dopamine reward system. And uh, the, meso, uh, the, the uh, forebrain motivational areas, a bit more out the front, uh, are apparently in common to um, being in love, uh, being addicted, and uh, being rejected at least in this group of people who had not yet given up on uh, recovering their, uh, their lover and picking up from where they had left off. If they have given up completely, uh, the brain might be registering a slightly different pattern of activity. Other studies have uh, looked at heart rate in people who are given an experience of rejection. This is a very experimental study in which they submitted photographs of themselves which were supposedly evaluated by potential dates or partners. And they were later given feedback as to whether this person that they fancied terribly uh, was interested in them. And uh, the interesting thing was that if they uh, found that an attractive person had given them a knockback, theoretically, this would result in a slowing of the heart rate. The heart break, incidentally, uh, is a deliberate uh, spelling error <laughs> to uh, give it that other, uh, the idea of slowing down. Uh, and uh, what does a slowing heart rate mean? Well, it's a, a function of the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, uh, whereas the, the sympathetic is concerned with mobilizing resources for fight and flight. The parasympathetic goes the other way. It uh, is concerned with calming you down and uh, compiling resources for, for future use. And uh, a slowed heart rate is in a sense uh, equivalent to fainting or shock in extreme forms. Shock in the medical sense of uh, extremely low blood pressure. 
and uh, it, it can be thought of as a sort of, well, I give up. I, I will go depressed because there's no point in thrashing myself at, at this point. I'll um, save, it for a, for a, save it to fight another day. Now, the immense grief of losing a partner to a long-term partner to death apparently uh, results in a lot of premature deaths. In this um, Scottish study, 40% of men and 26% uh, of women uh, had died within three years of their partner. And it's beyond chance. Uh, the, the hazard ratio, as they call it, is something like 1.4 for both men and women. It's the same uh, increased likelihood of dying uh, as a result of the loss of your partner. Um, the fact that it's 40% of men, 20%, 6 of women, of course, just refers to the fact that men tend to pop it earlier than women anyway, so that if their wife has died earlier, then uh, they are at much greater risk uh, because life expectation is shorter. But the loss of a partner apparently does have an impact uh, on um, the other partner for, particularly in the early years, particularly in the first six months, uh, but uh, may have even longer term repercussions. The causes of death themselves were highly variable. Cancer, heart disease, suicide and accident, pretty much all the, the usual causes of death, just that they are more likely to happen within a short time of losing a partner. I promised to deal with uh, how to... Uh, recover from a broken heart. That was a bit reckless, I'm afraid, because it's a major topic in itself. And I don't want to turn it too much into a, a sort of a self-help uh, lesson. <laughs> but uh, it has many um, aspects in common with kicking a drug habit. Uh, the first thing is to realize that you're not to, bra to blame for the breakup of your relationship. There are lots of reasons why relationships break down and it's uh, not, necessar not necessary to assume that you are to blame, uh, nor is your ex uh, necessarily to blame. So uh, you can avoid uh, getting all bitter and twisted about it. It's a good idea to call up your social support. Your family and friends can help you through uh, the early days particularly, but uh, be careful not to drive them away by being miserable and uh, self-pitying because uh, they will quickly tire of that kind of thing. The key, uh, I suppose, to rebuilding is uh, initially distraction, that is to do other things. Keep as active as possible, uh, take up hobbies that you might have dropped before, uh, immerse yourself in work projects, and uh, of course um, find other people as fast as possible because ultimately that will be the best cure is to uh, set up a new relationship. Uh, it's best to avoid old associations, poring over love letters and uh, photographs, um, or visiting old haunts, unless perhaps you're going with somebody new to lay down new memories. Important to look after your health, keep fit, uh, which will, of course, help you get a new partner if, if that's uh, something that you're intending to do. And uh, pamper yourself is a suggestion. You know, get uh, spa treatments and massage and all that kind of thing will help see you through. But uh, it is a matter of time. Some of these things might uh, just speed up the process. Now, styles of attachment will, to some extent, uh, predict the way that people respond to uh, a breakup of a relationship. And uh, attachment styles are um, traditionally, or uh, rather empirically, classified uh, in relation to two big dimensions. One is called anxiety, which is um, the tendency to be afraid that your partner is going to run off, that... Uh, and you're going to be left bereft. The other one is avoidance, which is uh, feeling discomfort if other people are getting too close to you. 
And uh, these are attachment styles that are classified in relation to the, pr the two primary orthogonal dimensions called secure, preoccupied, dismissive, fearful. They have various names in, in different people's research, but uh, that is perhaps uh, one of the most common descriptive systems. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, the psychoanalytic psychologists like Bowlby uh, have always assumed that we learned our attachment styles in early relationships with our parents. But uh, behavior genetic research suggests that that is, uh, is not really so. That uh, about half of the, the variance is genetic and the rest of it is down to the non-shared environment. That is uh, the environment that is outside of the home, that uh, experiences that are not shared with siblings. So uh, parental treatment or the treatment that you get in early childhood from the caretakers that you're exposed to does not seem to be uh, critical in determining your attachment style. Another discovery that has been made is that oxytocin is um, levels of secretion are connected with scores on the anxiety dimension of attachment styles. And uh, while the cause and effect could go either way, the researchers that discovered this connection uh, reckoned that um, oxytocin was the effect rather than the cause of the anxiety and in fact that it was probably being generated uh, as an anxiolytic, uh, the purpose being to promote relationships by increasing the willingness to take risks uh, rather close to the Talus explanation of mania uh, in relation to love. Researchers uh, Sophia and all uh, defined pathological love as an uncontrollable, over-possessive caring for a partner that's recognized by the individual themselves as destructive to other aspects of their life, like their family and their career. Don Jose being a case in point, if anybody knows the opera Carmen, uh, who sacrificed his military career and his fiancée and broke himself off for his family in favor of the gypsy Carmen who immediately ran off with a bullfighter and uh, it ended in tears rather inevitably. Um, these people's research looked at the personality types of people suffering this uh, pathological degree of love and they found that compared with normals they were inclined to be impulsive, not surprising, reward dependent that is needing, being a, of an addictive personality, I suppose, a bit, a bit needy, uh, inclined towards smoking and drinking, for example. Uh, spiritual actually uh, doesn't quite mean religious. It means something more like dissociative, a tendency to be a bit histrionic. Uh, and they were tended to be low in self-esteem. That's perhaps not all surprising, but uh, they noted quite striking uh, differences between PL people and uh, normals in relation to the uh, attachment styles. They were lower in self-esteem, they were less secure and more anxious in their attachment styles than, uh, than a control group. Now, of course, there are other forms of pathological love, uh, particularly the kinds which are psychotic in the sense of being delusional, but we'll come on to those shortly. In terms of the attachment styles, it's been discovered that pet owners uh, tend to be more attached to their pet than to their partner, uh, which, uh, is that uh, pathological? Well, maybe not, because... Pets emit uh, infant signals that arouse parental instincts and hence they serve as child substitutes. They don't argue with you, they don't leave home uh, <laughs> and uh, they have been shown to reduce stress, for example, as indexed by lowered blood pressure and they do seem to increase longevity. So the widowhood effect may be counted 
by having a pet. Incidentally, I don't think I'm supposed to call them pets anymore. According to the PC Brigade, they are now animal companions. <laughs> it's apparently <laughs> patronizing to call them pets. Jealousy uh, is an emotion that most of us feel from time to time uh, when you feel threatened by a love rival. It's a normal uh, experience, uh, although you don't necessarily have to be self-righteous about it. Uh, and it uh, may have positive functions, increasing our mate retention behaviours, ideally being nicer and more attentive to our partner. And it's well known that uh, some women in particular use flirtatious behaviour not because they're necessarily all that attracted to the other person, but they want to uh, get a rise out of their mate and uh, a bit more attention from them. Uh, men, when they're flirting, usually have something else in mind. Uh, so jealousy is actually evoked uh, primarily by um, sexual penetration in the case of men. The um, evolutionary origin of that is pretty straightforward. They are concerned about being cuckolded. Uh, for women, it's uh, emotional involvement that they're more concerned about because they fear the loss of uh, the relationship and perhaps all the resources that might uh, be carried with it. Uh, so overall, men are more concerned about sexual infidelity, women more concerned about emotional betrayal, but uh, there are differences within attachment styles as well. People with secure <laughs> attachment styles are um, less obsessed by sexual fidelity. Uh, people with dismissing attachment styles, that is um, the, uh, those that value or practice autonomy, uh, tend to be more jealous in the sexual sphere than the emotional. <laughs> now, obviously, the um, attributes of the rival uh, will alter the degree to which one feels jealous. In the case of women, uh, jealousy is increased when the rival is attractive, and uh, studies using subliminal exposure to attractive female faces will apparently increase the extent to which uh, a jealousy-invoking scenario is... Uh, found to be effective on a person. Uh, what would the male equivalent be? Well, it's um, almost certainly social dominance or status. And one marker of this is stature, height. And there are studies showing that short men experience greater jealousy than tall men. However, they uh, are less likely to turn that into violence. I suppose <laughs> they are actually not very effective if they're going to get themselves into a fight, they're more likely to come off worse. Apparently, the extent of jealousy in women is affected by the contraceptive pills that they might be on. Those that are high in synthetic estrogens uh, will increase their jealousy. Uh, the pro progesterone content of the pill doesn't seem to be implicated uh, now, it's complicated by the fact that uh, the pill works by introducing uh, an external source of the hormone which shuts down the internal production. So it's not at all clear that oestrogen is what makes people jealous. Uh, it could equally be argued the other way around. However, there are studies that show that men who have low prenatal testosterone, as indicated by the 2D, 4D finger ratio, which you've almost certainly heard about by now, uh, also tend to show more jealousy, um, which would suggest a, a connection between femininity and jealousy. Again, uh, I'm not certain that these particular studies broke down jealousy into the, the classic male-female components. I think that it would be interesting to see that done because the, the picture is almost certainly more complicated than that. Stalking uh, refers to the repeated unwanted following or harassment uh, of another person, either physically or through um, modern communications like uh, email and uh, telephone. 
Um, there's a lot of it about, but so it comes in various forms. The, um, the reasons vary, a common one being just refusal to recognize that a relationship is over and ought to be given a decent burial. Uh, then there is uh, the effort to start a relationship with somebody who is actually unattainable and out of reach, which is the classic uh, celebrity stalking phenomenon. Uh, there are various uh, forms of social incompetence. You can construe stalking in, in terms of clumsy courtship, uh, which I'll mention again shortly with an example. Uh, sometimes it is uh, planning a sexual assault. Of course, that's the possibly the most sinister kind of stalking. Serial killers will sometimes stalk their victims. One way or another, about 8% of women and 2% of men have been stalked. Most stalkers are male and their victims are female. However, if the victim is a man, he is just as likely to be stalked uh, by a woman as by a man. Some of the stalkers are uh, psychotic. That is, they are deluded that the other person might one day give them the time of day. Others are obsessional. Some of them are personality disordered, uh, particularly of the antisocial, narcissistic and paranoid varieties. Queen Victoria had a stalker, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, there was a book written about it uh, recently by uh, Ian Bonderson. Apparently this was a chap called Edward Jones who habitually broke into the apartments in Buckingham Palace and uh, rooted through her underwear and so on. <laughs> he was uh, discovered lurking in her dressing room uh, and arrested and put before a magistrate who rather um, said a bit of a jolly jape this and dismissed it as a, what he described as a daring folly. I uh, can't imagine that happening today, but uh, he became, this chap, uh, Edward Jones, became a folk hero, and um, <laughs> he did it again several times, apparently, <laughs> spent uh, uh, quite a bit of his time lurking about and hiding in, in the palace until eventually they got sick of it and deported him to Australia. <laughs> oh, probably did him a favour. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yes, as I say, um, some forms of stalking look like clumsy courtship. That um, women do put men through courtship rituals, really, uh, in order to test their devotion. And uh, persistence is one of the tests of how much smitten they are. And sometimes that persistence will pay off. Uh, so, uh, inevitably, some men will get this terribly wrong and they will carry on pursuing a person who is not remotely interested in them, despite uh, cues that ought to be obvious to most people that they're never going to be successful. And I think a good example is Gwyneth Paltrow had a stalker who sent her five love letters a day, flowers, chocolate, pizza and pornography. Now, that may be a way to impress some women, but uh, perhaps not Gwyneth Paltrow. <laughs> now, stalking by an ex-partner is the most common and also the most dangerous form of, of stalking other than the serial killer stalking. And these are usually what you might call controlling males. Uh, they are a little bit on the psychopathic side and being stalked by a partner is a particularly intrusive form because of course they know your lifestyle, they know your, your habits, where you're likely to go, who your family and friends are, so they can be one step ahead of you. Uh, they know you go to pick up the children from school at a uh, particular time and place and they can be there to intercept and they will use the, the children as an additional tool of intimidation. Uh, very often the prior relationship is abusive and coercive and violent, so that in a sense the stalking is business as usual. It uh, very often begins while the relationship is intact, but it tends to escalate and is likely to become more dangerous after a separation. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, when the wife says, I don't want to see you anymore and I'm interested in somebody else, that is, uh, is, is seen as major provocation to this kind of a stalker. It uh, lasts on average about two years. It causes enormous disruption and distress to the victim, anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder and so on, uh, especially so when there are threats of violence. Uh, which may or may not be carried out, but apparently actual violence occurs in about 50% of cases, and that's very much higher than non-partner stalking. When a woman has been murdered, the chances are about 50% apparently that it was by an intimate or an ex-intimate, a partner, husband, former or present. And uh, these researchers, McFarlane, looked at partner stalking behaviours in the year preceding uh, the murder or attempted murder of the woman. About two-thirds of them had been stalked before they were, uh, an attempt was made on their life, and two-thirds assaulted prior to the murder attempt, so they're not good indicators. But uh, there were a couple of things they picked out as being particular prognosticators, uh, of the murder attempt. Um, not surprisingly, if they've been spied on or followed, that is, stalked, uh, they're twice as likely to be uh, killed as other women subjected to abuse of other forms. And, uh, but the real um, marker of dangerousness, I suppose, are threats to harm the children if the woman left or did not return. They're associated with a ninefold risk of murder compared with the control group of abusive men. So the picture comes from the film Niagara, incidentally, in which uh, Marilyn Monroe was on honeymoon with this chap, but uh, seeing a lover on the side. Uh, and hubby didn't appreciate that. <laughs> and ultimately kills her. Now, de Clerum, de Clerum Bolt syndrome uh, is a bit of a fancy name. It's uh, the name of the French psychiatrist who identified it in 1921. I suspect he became uh, a victim of it himself, which is how he <laughs> recognised it. It's the delusional belief that you are loved by another person most commonly, it occurs in middle-aged women who believe that a known high-status male, often their doctor or their lawyer, some professional that they are dealing with, is secretly in love with them, but prevented from uh, declaring his love because of some problem. Either he's terribly shy or, more often, he's married. Uh, but the fact that he loves them is betrayed by subtle little signals that they are giving out like he smiled at me, or uh, he's wearing a tie of my favourite colour. And th that is a cryptic clue uh, that he is terribly in love with me, and uh, if it wasn't for the fact that I was married, of course, we would be together. And that is the circumstance in which it is most likely to become dangerous, because these uh, women are likely to kill either the wife uh, to clear the way, or the man himself, because they ultimately get so angry with these ambiguous signals. Uh, you might be familiar with the film uh, Fatal Attraction. There was another one called Play Misty for me with Clint Eastwood in it, same sort of idea. And uh, points up the fact that not all erotomania or de declarambos is totally delusional. That is, it, it sometimes starts with a, a one night stand uh, at least that's the way the male partner perceives it. He doesn't want to pursue the relationship any further, but in the meantime, the woman has become obsessed by him, and she um, makes attempts to pursue the relationship, which fail. She turns to progressive stalking and uh, will perhaps end up by wrecking the man's life one way or another, getting angry about the fact that he has uh, made use of her 
Uh, and uh, again, murder of either of the man or other members of his family uh, will occur very occasionally. I, I should point out that it is rather rare, with the, the fact that uh, there are well-publicized famous cases of people who have been killed uh, shouldn't be taken to mean that a rotomania necessarily would end in murder. That, it is uh, a minority of stalkings and erotomanias that, uh, that end quite so tragically. But uh, it can be a serious thing. This, this is a real case. Um, you might have seen a television film called You Be Dead recently, uh, which was an, an account of this woman, Maria Marchese, who was uh, an Argentinian-born woman who um, was uh, pursuing her psychiatrist, Dr. Jan Falkowski. Actually, she wasn't his patient. Uh, I think uh, his patient was somebody that she knew. So it wasn't uh, the case of him, uh, of him treating her. Uh, he didn't know who she was, really. She came out of the blue. But she stalked him rather relentlessly. She sent threats to both himself and his fiancée, uh, which freaked her out to the point that the relationship ultimately broke down because she couldn't believe that he wasn't up to something himself. Uh, she then proceeded to steal a used condom from a rubbish bin outside of his apartment, smeared her underwear with it, uh, accused him of rape and he was convicted on the basis of the DNA evidence. And nobody had any idea uh, where this DNA came from, of course, until uh, later they were able to uh, figure out what had happened and he was, uh, his conviction was ultimately overturned. So indeed it, it can be uh, quite a, an intrusive and destructive phenomenon. Some of the clinical features were rotomania. As I say, the extreme cases get a great deal of, of publicity, but uh, most erotomania is not particularly dangerous and it doesn't even lead to stalking. Um, it is associated with other psychotic, that is delusional, symptoms and uh, is likely to respond to low-dose antipsychotic uh, drug treatment. There seem to be strong family psychiatric histories uh, in erotomania which would suggest that genetic factors are involved. Uh, it's not all female. You do get male erotomaniacs uh, who are, although they are less common, they're frequently more dangerous because you know, males do tend to be <laughs> more dangerous in whatever they're doing. Uh, and a famous case, of course, is John Hinckley, the 25-year-old fellow who shot President Reagan uh, in an attempt uh, to kill Reagan and an attempt to impress Jodie Foster, with whom he was obsessed after seeing her uh, in this role uh, as a young prostitute in Taxi Driver. might have helped if she'd come out a bit earlier and he might not have uh, had to shoot President Reagan. Uh, now, as always, I, I tend to try to tie these phenomena back into evolutionary or adaptive explanations. And I think that the various forms of love sickness can be understood as evolutionary adaptations that have become a bit exaggerated or gone wrong in some way or another. Um, obsessional love uh, probably comes out of the mechanism for narrowing mate choice that I was talking about, um, I think, uh, in my last lecture about what is love. That um, you have uh, one biological mechanism for lust, which is based on the sex hormones, and then a, a second adaptation which is concerned with narrowing the field so that you are picking up on certain particular partners so that you don't um, deploy your courtship efforts in too much of a distributed shotgun uh, pattern. Uh, and that's what being in love is all about according to Helen Fisher and uh, other evolutionary psychologists. Uh, as Frank Tallis has, has suggested, mania 
which is one of the striking symptoms of being in love, uh, is probably a mechanism for overriding inhibitions that we have against procreative behavior, or at least we are capable of having, because as human beings we have uh, a powerful cerebral cortex which is capable of manufacturing concern for consequences and inhibiting our behavior, restraining our behavior. So uh, the idea is that the manic manifestation of love is a mechanism intended to override those restraints and push us into doing things which we will no doubt regret later but seem like a good idea at the time. Uh, depressive symptoms, which are also well known to occur in people in love, um, could be construed as a reaction to loss in a competitive struggle, uh, which if it were uh, a fight with another male, for example, would result in the loser male withdrawing so that they, they keep <laughs> themselves intact so that they might uh, fight another day. And uh, so that depression may have adaptive advantages, that it will, you will just step back a bit and uh, conserve your resources so that you are uh, better equipped to mobilize them again later when it will be more appropriate to do so. Extreme jealousy, uh, and uh, I didn't actually mention extreme jealousy, but uh, there are all these newspaper accounts of women scorned who have cut up the suits and uh, poured out all the expensive wine of their partner and so on, and they, they seem chuffed by that, that idea that uh, they've, they've made their point, they've uh, expressed their annoyance very, very powerfully. Um, partner stalking also can be thought of as either clumsy courtship or mate retention tactics that have been taken to extreme or become misdirected and um, probably ultimately counterproductive in that you're, you're not likely to actually win anybody back by cutting up their suits. Uh, and uh, <laughs> if you tell that account to the next bloke that you're lining up, he's probably <laughs> not going to be very impressed either. <laughs> he thinks she's a bit dangerous. <laughs> Go away and find somebody else. Um, female erotomania probably stems from the instinct to acquire a high-ranking long-term mate, which is, a, again, a very female trait that uh, w I mentioned the parental investment theory in, in some of my earlier lectures in which uh, males have this tendency to, uh, to seek multiple young partners, while females have more of an interest in acquiring uh, the ideal father and uh, protector for their, for their children and hence are uh, looking to attach themselves to a high ranking uh, male who ha shows indications that he might be prepared to hang about for the long term and very often these are men who are socially successful and very often older than, than the woman concerned. So uh, the characteristics of de bolts seem to be an exaggeration of uh, a classic female pattern, uh, which of course can be taken to the psychotic uh, deluded level, in which case uh, drugs might help to contain uh, those delusions. Neuroleptics, uh, the obsessional side uh, of, uh, of love might be dealt with by serotonin bo boosting antidepressant drugs. Um, and indeed the, these um, psychotropic drugs are used for these purposes but many people would say that uh, other forms of therapy uh, might be tried perhaps uh, instead of or in addition to drug treatments cognitive behavior therapy of one sort or another uh, might be used um, one might think of the treatment of Mad Margaret from Gilbert and Sullivan's Ruddy Gore uh, Mad Margaret was um, crazed by unreciprocated love for Despard and uh, they came up with this treatment that today is known as thought stopping which is that they provided her with a key word 
that could be used either by herself or by others that would, uh, would have a grounding, calming effect upon her. And they latched upon a word that was uh, described as teeming with hidden meaning. You know the word? Basingstoke. <laughs> so, so whenever Mad Margaret was getting a bit out of hand, uh, they'd say, Basingstoke, Margaret. Oh, Basingstoke it is. Yes. <laughs> a bit of the old uh, Monty Python aspect of, uh, <laughs> of Gilbert and Sullivan. Um, nothing new under the sun here. So uh, that's uh, really the end of, of uh, six lectures on the evolutionary basis of love. And uh, I, I think perhaps it um, could be summarized by a, a phrase from a Loyola University professor uh, called Michael Mills, I think was, it was his name. It's a, uh, I'm not sure where he got it from, but it, uh, he said that um, love is our ancestors whispering in our ears. And uh, I think that's quite a nice uh, way of, of thinking of um, the phenomena of love and uh, the evolutionary origins of them. Thank you very much.